So we're talking a little bit about how language matters and how the way we treat residents um, can affect them, you know, in the real world when, if and when they get out of here. You know, what has that been like for the Department of Corrections? It's been a, it's been a culture shift and really an evolution, um, but one that's really, it's been embraced in a very positive way, um, both with staff and with the resident population. Um, we've worked very hard over the last several years to instill what we call a culture of wellness. And really what that is, is just, you know, making sure that individuals who come into the care and custody of the department have their needs met and that we provide them with resources they need, services they need. And a significant part of that is how we communicate with them, how we address them, how we refer to them, um, not only inside our facilities, but with our external stakeholders. And so it's been, it's been a real shift. And it's, you know, the, the really neat thing about it is naturally when you when you start working to destigmatize and you really shift how you speak about things, it has a very positive effect without even having to drill down into why it's positive. Like just naturally as you talk that way, as staff interact that way, it's just very positive overall. And so you can feel the environment of our facilities reflect that. You don't feel uh, hostility, tension, or anything. It's a very respectful environment. And I attribute that a lot to how we communicate with each other and how we refer to each other. Why was this something the main Department of Corrections wanted to do? It's been a priority, uh, you know, for Commissioner Liberty, and I think it's really an extension of the work of Governor Mills. And so when Governor Mills came into office, you know, her first immediate priority was to provide services to those who need services through Medicaid expansion, but also through her opioid response. And the Department of Corrections was a significant stakeholder in the opioid response plan. And a piece of that is changing how we view things like substance use and the need for treatment and all of those issues that come with it. And our population here within the DOC has a lot of substance use issues that need to be addressed. And so, you know, we've really partnered with the governor, um, Director Gordon Smith, on their work to destigmatize substance use treatment. And with that, you know, we see it, it being an extension to really destigmatize corrections and the things that happen to lead up to incarceration and then transition out of corrections. So it's, we really didn't view it could be just one area focusing on destigmatization. It really needed to be a collective approach. And, you know, our goal ultimately is, again, to improve the wellness of people. And so when you refer to them differently, when you treat them with more respect, it helps as you address those needs. Uh, and so it really wraps into an overall priority of the commissioner uh, with the support of the governor. It's interesting you mention substance abuse. I was actually talking to a coworker last week who does a lot with substance use disorders. And um, she said, you know, it's, you don't want to call them addicts anymore. You want to call them someone with substance abuse disorder. Is that the same kind of thing? You know, you don't want to call them an inmate or a prisoner. You want to call them a resident. Is this all kind of tied together? Yes, it's all tied together. And when we started rolling out this idea of language matters to our staff and to our resident population, we did it in a very comprehensive manner. And so we didn't just shift from prisoner or inmate to resident. We started focusing on using uh, phrases like substance use disorder, substance use treatment, um, persons with substance use disorder, instead of saying things like addict, you know, instead of um, talking about um, failing a drug test or things like that. We just, we changed the language up even um, outside of substance use treatment, you know, um, in corrections, we have uh, historically referred to people as sex offenders. And we refer to that now as uh, persons with uh, problem sexual behavior and problem sexual behavior treatment, because that's really the industry standard for treatment language. Um, and so we do that all throughout everything, uh, all of our corrections operations. And it, it helps that we didn't just focus on substance use treatment. Um, it, it helps that we didn't just change the word resident uh, to resident uh, because it allows us to really impact across all of what we do versus just a very siloed approach. What do you say to, you know, there's obviously going to be the Facebook commenter when the story airs that, you know, oh, they're prisoners, they did horrible things. You know, what do you say to that person? Many people do horrible things. And, you know, our goal uh, in the DOC, our responsibility is not to judge them. Um, it's really to have them in our care and custody, and uh, we view our primary responsibility to return them to the community in a, in a healthier fashion so that our main communities are stronger. Um, and so in order to do that, 
we have to treat them with respect and we have to treat them with dignity and we have to provide them with the opportunities and services they need in order to return in a, in a stronger, healthier fashion. And so it doesn't do us any good to stigmatize them and to carry on and, and really fulfill those stigmas they've been living with while they're with us. Um, it really does us justice to treat them with respect, um, speak to them with respect, and then provide them with the opportunities they need. And, and the Language Matters Initiative is really a foundation for us to do that. Um, is, so is this the first correctional facility in Maine that is starting this, or are we doing this statewide? So our entire Department of Corrections has rolled this out, um, and so we're on into about a year and a half of it now. Um, and so that includes all five of our adult correctional facilities um, across the state, as well as our juvenile facility. Um, and then we also um, have this rolled out across our community corrections offices. So uh, juveniles and adults on probation, um, they're referred to as clients. Um, and they, all of the other terminologies that we use are also carried out in those, in those uh, settings as well. Is this going to, you know, if and when residents are released from um, Department of Corrections custody, do we think this will make the state safer? Absolutely. I mean, our overriding goal is public safety, as it should be. And when we have somebody releasing into the community who is untreated, um, been treated disrespectfully or and goes out in a manner that we would consider unhealthy, it puts the public at risk, at a higher risk. And then we're not doing our job of protecting the public. And so this is absolutely connected to our goal of public safety because treating with respect, encouraging and providing interventions, treatment resources and other things to make them healthier sends them into the community with a much stronger chance of staying in the community and contributing productively. Um, an individual who leaves the Department of Corrections now has opportunities for all levels of higher education, including a college uh, di diploma degree, which significantly increases their chance of staying out in the community and contributing um, through job, contributing to their family, and, and so forth. And so that ultimately reduces uh, the risk to the public and increases public safety. Is this good news for the greater community? We view it as good news. Um, you know, ultimately, it's good news if individuals stay out in the community, contribute, and don't come back to incarceration. And that's what we're seeing as a result of it in the very short term, and we think it's going to carry forward. Are there any statistics of that? So what we know right now, um, specifically to things like uh, medication-assisted treatment, uh, we know that the return to custody rate after a year is only 7%. Um, and so we, we measure all of that um, because this has only been in place for a year and a half or so. You know, we typically measure things in year increments. And so really over the next 6, 12, 18 months, we're going to have a lot of data that supports what we're doing. And I think that's going to hopefully convince those who are still skeptical um, about the work we're doing and show them that it really is protecting the public, but it's also creating uh, healthier uh, people when they leave, leave incarceration. Do any of these programs cost more taxpayer dollars? No, so uh, that's another great thing, um, is the Department of Corrections has not asked for an additional dime um, from the taxpayers in order to do any of this. Um, instead, what we've done is we've taken the services that we provide and we've, put, we've modernized them, humanized them, and really used new language and new approaches um, and we've created great partnerships. So we have partnerships with uh, four colleges um, in Maine and outside of Maine. We have partnerships with uh, community colleges for vocational services. And those are partnerships where they come in and don't require us um, to provide significant amounts of funding to them um, in order to provide these services. They want to help us uh, with this mission. And so there, there's not an increased cost to taxpayers. And in the end, there's a savings to taxpayers when individuals don't come back to incarceration and our population stays reduced. Anything else you think I should know? The, the only thing I would add is that, you know, this ultimately is about protecting Maine communities and making Maine a safer, healthier place. And when we do that by intervening in the lives of people incarcerated, we're ultimately helping our main communities because individuals that are incarcerated come back into our into our communities. Uh, a, a majority of them return to the location that they came from, uh, to their family members and their friends, and we want them to do that in the healthiest manner possible and in a manner that protects victims, increases public safety, but also allows them to contribute in, in a positive way.